Okay, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time today to become, be on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. So just a, a, a brief introduction for people who may not have heard of you. Uh, who, who are you and uh, what are you up to at the moment? So my name is Eric Trexler. I'm the director of education at Stronger by Science. I'm one of the reviewers for Mass, which is a monthly research review. Uh, my background started as an athlete, uh, wasn't that good at sports, turned pro in natural bodybuilding, got my PhD in human movement science. And while I was working on my PhD, a lot of my research focused on one of two topics. Uh, the first topic was uh, dietary supplements. The second topic was uh, how metabolic rate changes as we lose and gain weight. Uh, and basically all sorts of interventions to change body composition. So either lose fat or gain muscle. Perfect. Which, which brings us nicely onto the, the topic of today's conversation, this whole idea of metabolic adaptation to weight loss in particular. And uh, just for the listeners, could you just give us a brief overview of, of, of what that is, I guess, and the difference between someone who would say that their metabolism is damaged and, and someone who might just have adapted to rates of weight loss? Yeah. So metabolic adaptation. Um, so when we lose weight, obviously we are becoming a smaller human being with less metabolically active tissue, right? So um, larger people have more tissue and they are able to eat more without a change in their body weight. They just need more energy to fuel that body. So when we lose weight, we do expect that energy expenditure or metabolic rate will go down to some extent. But what we observe is that with weight loss, uh, in many cases, it seems to go down more than it should. So there, there's what we would call an adaptive reduction in energy expenditure. And the way that this issue typically presents itself to us is we maybe make an adjustment to our diet, we start losing some weight, and eventually that weight loss slows down. Or we make an adjustment, it slows down, we make another adjustment, it slows down, it makes, we make another adjustment and it slows down. So we're further along in the diet and we find ourselves in a position where we look at our caloric intake and we're like, this is very, very low, much lower than I would have expected. So that, that's usually the two different uh, ways that people interact with metabolic adaptation or become aware of it. Those are the two ways that people tend to observe it in their own life. Um, and so that's, that's basically what it is. Right. And so in, in terms of why this happens, I guess then, cause we've got this idea of people trying to lose weight and then their, their weight loss stalls and they think, right, well, the only way to do it is either increasing energy expenditure or lowering uh, caloric intake or, or maybe a combination. But why is it that that would happen to people who are losing weight? Um, what are the, the factors that cause that to happen? Yeah. So, you know, when I first started getting into science and physiology, I will admit that my bias was I was more interested in the periphery, peripheral tissues outside of the central nervous system. I just mm -hmm. thought they were cool and they're, they're frankly easier to understand than, than the brain in the central nervous mm -hmm. system. But the more I studied doing my undergrad master's PhD, the more I realized, uh, as much as I hate it, the brain seems to be pretty influential. Um, obviously, it controls mm. everything. So when we look at weight loss, there, there's a, a couple things that happen, right? So in order to induce weight loss, we are in negative energy balance, which means mm. we're burning more calories during a day than we are consuming through food. So we are in what we would call an acute energy deficit. You know, from a day-to-day -day perspective, we are in a net negative in terms of energy or calories. The other thing that happens with weight loss is when we're in negative energy balance for a reasonable amount of time in a row, you know, consecutively, um, obviously we lose body mass. Typically a, a large, a large percentage of that is going to be fat mass, not all of it, but a large percentage. Mm -hmm. So two things uh, that happen here when we're in an energy deficit, that seems to acutely cause a hormone called leptin to go down. Mm -hmm. Now, when we lose fat mass, that also 
causes leptin to go down. And leptin, like I said, is this hormone. It's mostly produced in fat cells. Uh, it's responsive to the loss of fat mass, but also acute energy deficits. And leptin through the blood feeds back into the brain and goes somewhere called the hypothalamus. It's, mm -hmm. it's a key center in the brain, remarkably influential part of the brain that basically one of its many roles is to integrate uh, with, with all sorts of different uh, control mechanisms. How much energy are we spending? How much energy are we consuming? And what should we do about it? Mm -hmm. So the hypothalamus plays roles in your activity level. It plays roles in uh, hunger and appetite, your feeding habits. So basically, w when we ask the question, why does this metabolic adaptation occur? The simplest answer is that because of our acute energy deficit and our fat loss, leptin goes down, the hypothalamus senses that, and the hypothalamus recognizes a threat. Mm -hmm. The threat being that we are not consuming enough energy to meet our demands, and we need to do something about that. And so mm -hmm. when your hypothalamus decides we have to do something about that, there's really only a couple things it can do. You know, th this calories in, calories out stuff is simple on the surface, but there's a lot of things that go into calories in and calories out. So the hypothalamus can control things like how much energy are we going to expend subconsciously? Um, how prone are we to engage in physical activities outside of structured exor exercise? And also it's going to make you very, very, very hungry and fixated on food. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those where it just becomes harder and harder for the body to lose weight in this idea of that, almost that uh, survival instinct mode. We're almost wired to just basically protect losses of mass. And, and would this affect then even people who are um, a fair bit overweight in terms of body fat percentage? Or is their adaptation going to be slower? Does it affect more of the leaner population? It's a good question. Um... The short answer is yes, it could affect people that are a little bit overweight or obese. But what we see is that the more severe instances, uh, as you would imagine, are observed in more severe circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing to keep in mind is, is you know, this idea of are you metabolically adapted? There are, there's a spectrum of exactly how unfavorable this is. Mm -hmm. So let's say you start fairly overweight or obese. Um, and you lose 10% of your body weight. Uh, so if you start, I'm going to do American units because go ahead. Yeah, yeah. make it easy for you. No, go ahead. Yeah. It's all good. So, uh, you know, let's say you started at, at 300 pounds, you had a, a good amount of body fat mm -hmm. and you lose 10% 10, 10 of your body fat. So you go from 300 pounds to 270 pounds. Um, it's a significant, it's a significant weight loss, but it's mm. not a, you know, remarkably extreme case. You're not extraordinarily lean and you haven't lost like several hundred pounds or anything mm -hmm. in that situation. You're probably going to see potentially that in fact, there is some adaptive reduction in your total energy expenditure, but a person in that situation, first of all, your, your total energy expenditure throughout the day should still be relatively high. Yeah. Um, you're, you're still a large person with a lot of body mass. And if you're doing physical activity throughout the day, you, you, should be, you shouldn't be in a position where you have to be on 900 calories a day to continue mm -hmm. that weight loss. Okay. Another thing that w one of the reasons that metabolic adaptation is so uh, annoying <laughs> is because there are effects on things like thyroid hormone and sex hormones. There are a lot of kind of downstream endocrine effects mm -hmm. of, of once you're in this state. A lot of those more um, unfavorable, pretty extreme shifts in endocrine status don't seem to start happening until we get pretty lean. Right. Okay. So uh, if you go from, you know, fairly obese, and I'm just using the clinical terminology, no judgment or anything like that. No, not sure. But, but you know, if you transition from an obese body composition status to overweight, for example, mm -hmm. um, you're probably not going to see enormous reductions in thyroid hormone. You're, if you're a man, your testosterone is not going to drop, you know, like crazy. If you're a woman, you're not going to see huge fluctuations in estrogen. You're not going to be unlikely to run into issues with amenorrhea as long as the 
energy def- deficit isn't enormous. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so basically, it doesn't start to get really, really unpleasant until you either get super lean or have lost a really incredible amount of weight. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so the, the, the example of that would be that there was some pretty appreciable uh, metabolic adaptation observed in people who did the biggest loser study yeah. uh, or the biggest loser competition. And they, they wrote a study about it. Mm-hmm. Um, they still probably were, were in a pretty good spot from an endocrine position, but, but they did have a, a pretty sizable reduction in energy expenditure. But the, the thing that's tricky about that is you, you look at someone in that position who has lost, you know, a couple hundred pounds maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you look at the cons of their weight loss and it's like, oh, well, they should be uh, able to eat this many calories. But in reality, they have to eat 10% fewer than that or something sure. like that to maintain yeah. their current body weight. Yeah, but yeah. the pros of their weight loss is now they <laughs> have reduced their risk of like 35 different chronic diseases. <laughs> They've probably extended their lifespan. They feel better. They're happier. They can move around easier. So, um, so it doesn't start to be a really, really unfavorable thing until you start to get really lean. Sure. And I guess there's a, there's a couple points there that we can segue into really because first of all you mentioned this idea of relative energy deficiency and well you you know you noted the idea of having a deficit that's too large you didn't call it that i've i've just brought that term to the table so this idea of having a deficit too large and potentially bringing relative energy deficiency particularly with women um can be quite detrimental for health reasons is this something that you need to be aware of as as you said like an overweight to obese person with the idea of the size of the deficit that you create and the rate of weight loss that you're trying to achieve each week is there like a certain threshold that people should be going for to reduce these kind of adaptations well it it, it gets into a a tricky spot there so Mm. i'll i'll go ahead and uh disclose my bias is that i typically work with fairly athletic people sure um so i i certainly don't claim to be an obesity expert by any means Mm -hmm. um you know and that's why metabolic adaptation is one of those things that i've uh done a lot of work on is because a lot of my potential clients want to go from uh, either a little bit heavy to lean or they want to go from lean to shockingly lean. Yeah. Leaner. Uh, yeah. yeah. So here's the thing with, with balancing that in overweight or obese individuals, you can uh, get to a spot where there are at least in the short term, some unfavorable aspects of being in a large energy deficit. Mm-hmm. Um, however, up in that body composition range, it becomes a bit of a cost benefit analysis. So if I go to someone who has, let's say, uh, you know, they're going to need to lose 150 pounds to be in a healthy body weight category, Mm -hmm. uh, based on the literature, I'm not going to go to them and say, "Uh Oh, uh, I wanted you to lose half a percent of body weight per week. And you're at 0.7% per week, because we have a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. So at a certain point, we just want to get that ball rolling and, mm-hmm. and we want to build up some kind of weight loss momentum. The problem is if you jump in too extreme, then the question is, if we start running into roadblocks, where do we go from there? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in a lot of the medical literature, you'll see some of these fairly aggressive weight loss uh, interventions where they basically say like, all right, 800 calories here, you know, here's a couple little nutrient shakes per day. This is your diet now. Mm. And, uh, absolutely. That's going to work that it, that is going to work, but, mm. um, it's probably going to be pretty unpleasant. And the question is, can you get somebody to stay engaged in that intervention and continue it for the amount of time it's going to require to get down to a healthy body weight? And if someone has a lot of weight to lose, we're talking about a stagnant program with no variation and no changes and nothing to kind of keep them engaged with it for months and months and months and months on end. Hmm. So uh, it's also just a a pretty horrible way to try to maintain your normal eating habits and, you know, the social aspects of eating and things like that. So um, I I guess the the short answer to your question is that we can see signs of relative energy deficiency, even in people who are overweight, we can, Mm -hmm. but there is a cost benefit analysis of, 
a lot of times we need to get someone who's very overweight to a healthy body, uh, a healthy body weight as promptly as we can. And in some cases you will find uh, circumstances where it makes sense to say, you know, relative energy deficiency, we typically view it from an athletic perspective. When, sure. when you look it up, you're going to see like the International Olympic Committee writing about it. Yeah, and yeah. W- what they're talking about is we've got these athletes who are training like crazy, under eating, and they're doing detrimental things to their performance, detrimental things to their uh, the regularity of their menstrual cycle, detrimental things to their bone health. Mm-hmm. Um, those are not particularly prudent concerns when we're talking about getting someone into a healthy body weight category. Sure. Well, let's talk about that then, because I've, I've worked with um, and, and still work with some people within the athletic population. There will be people of that listening to this show. And so with regards to that idea then that you just said, it's usually, um, as you said, female athletes who train hours and hours a week, high intensity training. Um, they're, pretty lean already but they want to get leaner and they think yeah you know i need to implement a calorie deficit so let's say this you know someone's like 60 odd kilos and they're trying to eat 12 1100 1200 calories a day but they're training one to two hours a day of quite high intense activity is are they basically just shooting themselves in the foot is it more of an idea of where they need to do less training or eat more like where do they start to go from there can you repeat the uh, the circumstance there? So let's say they're like a 65 kilo female. So it'd be 135 pounds ish okay. for, for you guys, you know, training one to two hours for three to four times a week, high intensity training, trying fairly to lose, lean person, fairly lean. Yeah. You know, okay. like visible ab tissue, Yeah. Okay. Um, trying to lose weight, but they're not getting anywhere. Is that a uh, falling off the wagon issue? Is that a case of actually you need to probably eat more and have less of an aggressive deficit and where do they go? Yeah. So we've got a person who's lean, but once you get leaner, they're training hard and their weight loss is stalled. Yes. Okay. Um, there's a few things I do in that situation. I do get a lot of people who come to me in that situation. Mm -hmm. And I will say one of the, one of the things I often see there is the person is very rigid and, and adheres extremely well for about 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. And so it'll be like you've you've got them in the groove and they're in the swing of things for three weeks. They take one week where they're kind of (laughs) MIA. You know, they kind of do their own thing. All of a sudden their macros aren't getting tracked and they miss a workout here or there. And then they come back in the fifth week and they're they're on again. Yeah. And so what you do is over a few cycles of that, they say, listen, I'm eating 1,200 calories a day. And I'm not making any progress, but you're like, no, nah, you're, you're eating 1200 calories a day, 80% of the time. Right. And then 20% of the time, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> and yeah. I'm going to assume it's not 1200 calories a day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So part of it in that situation, mm-hmm. question is, what do we do about that? Um, there, you could make an argument that it makes sense to say, well, if, if 1200 calories is causing us to go completely off the track, 20% of the time, I wonder how much adherence would improve if we were at 1400 calories instead. Yeah. And so here's the thing that gets tricky. Some people I've, I've heard, I've heard smart people say this, people who know their stuff. I've heard people say, you're not losing weight because you're not eating enough and mm-hmm. you're in starvation mode. Yeah. That is an a scientific premise. It is not correct. It has never been demonstrated in any well-controlled study in any organism. Mm. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't happen. And and the, the, the analogy that I use to, or the, the scenario I use to help people think of this is when's the last time you took your dog to the vet, to the vet, right? And the vet says, your dog is extremely overweight. I'm concerned that you might not be feeding it enough. (laughs) It's never happened. All they tell you is we need to take, you know, two scoops down to one scoop and go on an extra walk every day. Right. So we know how this works when there's not an emotional attachment to it. Mm -hmm. We all know it. But once we get that emotional attachment, because there are social factors with eating, we do it with our family and our friends. And then there's also that inherent connection of if you talk about my adherence, now you're saying that I'm not committed or I'm not dedicated or I'm lying. Mm -hmm. So once these emotional factors come into play, um, 
And then there's guilt about going off the track and kind of doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts to get, to get muddied a little bit. But at the end of the day, we are trying to solve a math e equation here. Mm -hmm. If weight loss is stalled, we need to figure out how we're going to shift your energy balance to negative. Yeah. And so I might increase the calories I'm telling you to eat from 1200 to 1300, but it's because I'm trying to minimize the risk of those that week at the end of the month where you way over consume and you undo all of the, all the progress we made the three weeks prior. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a huge point of confusion there. No one is in a state where they are failing to lose weight because they're eating too little. Um, now the only caveat to that, mm -hmm. the only caveat would be every now and then you will find someone who is in a short term plateau, mm -hmm. short term, not months on end. And they're basically like, I'm training really hard. I'm being very good with my calorie tracking. My adherence is on is a hundred percent. Um, but for a week or two weeks or something, I've been completely stalled. And so I've been training harder because it annoys me that I'm stalled and I don't know what's going on. In some cases, what you'll see is that it could be a case of water retention. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, a cool thing that happened to me that I've observed in other people as well. And there's, there are scientific mechanisms to explain it. Mm -hmm. But when we're in that state where training volume is really high and training mm -hmm. intensity is really high um, and we're just, we've just got all sorts of cortisol pumping through our veins a lot of times I can induce some degree of water retention. And there was an instance where I was prepping for a bodybuilding competition. And like I said, calories in and calories out, this thing works and it's a fairly straightforward balance. I made a dietary change. I think I was like eight weeks out and I needed to really make some fat loss progress. My weight was stable, 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 stable. And I was expecting a fairly linear drop. And so each day I'm getting more and more concerned. Because mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a, not a lot of time to work with here, and so as I get more concerned, I start training harder, um, not making huge changes to the program, but just really pushing the intensity. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I was like, "This is a problem," because I don't appear to be making any progress, and I'm running out of time. So I kind of just took a leap of faith and said, "Maybe this is water retention." So what I'm going to do, and listen to how counterintuitive this is, because I'm not losing weight. And I have a bodybuilding show in six or seven weeks now. I'm going to not go near a gym for like four or five days. Mm -hmm. I did that. I chilled. I kept my diet the same and immediately shed pounds of, of water weight. Wow. Uh, just fluid retention because I was training myself into the dirt. I wasn't recovering. I was stressing out. And so <laughs> once that kind of fluid shift occurred, uh, I looked at the scale and I was exactly where I thought I would have been with that linear track of weight loss. Right, right, yeah. But again, this is short-term stuff. So yeah. if you're in a spot where you're like, it's been months and months and months and I've gotten nowhere, usually when you pry more in those cases, you find that there are either, a person is either overestimating their energy expenditure, mm -hmm. they are not tracking their food correctly, but they might genuinely be trying and not lying, but there might be legitimate inaccuracies in their sure. tracking yeah yeah um, or they might be in the other scenario i mentioned where they're very rigid for four weeks in a row or five weeks in a row but then that next week you can do a, a pretty remarkable amount of uh you can undo a lot of fat loss with just a week or two of falling off course yeah um, and that, that's not to stress anybody out but it's a reality. But when we're talking about inducing weight loss deep into a diet, we're talking about pretty small deficits from day to day. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can eat a lot in a few days if you, if you really uh, lose track of, uh, of tracking, right? So I mean, yeah. if you go off the rails and, and just completely ignore it and indulge a little bit, you can, you can add a lot of calories in. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing I want to be really clear about, whenever you talk about adherence and you kind of make, uh, you know, you kind of giggle about it and make some jokes about things you've seen. Um, I never want to minimize uh, the challenge involved with weight loss. And I never want to minimize how uh, distressing it can be to run into plateaus. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, it's tough because I come into this space and go on these podcasts and immediately I have the strike against me that I'm a competitive bodybuilder. And so people are like, oh, this guy's a meathead. He's probably a narcissist. He probably has all sorts of uh, negative uh, viewpoints about people who struggle with, with their weight. Mm. Th those are all extremely untrue. Um, and, and my whole thing is I don't care what anybody else weighs. I just want people to feel good about themselves, feel healthy and have control and autonomy over their own body composition. So if you want to be lean, it's important to me that you have the, the perceived uh, self-efficacy and autonomy to make that happen. If you yeah. want to take more control over your health um, and you feel like right now your body composition is in an unhealthy place, I want you to have, again, the self-efficacy self and the autonomy to take control of that. I don't, it doesn't uh, matter to me if you do that or not. Yeah, um, yeah. I just want you to feel good about yourself and feel like you have control of your own life. So, so I, I don't want to make light of these things where people, where I say, oh, they, you know, they're good for 80% of the time and then where'd they go for the other 20%. But yeah, it's yeah. something to, I think some people underestimate exactly how much they can undo mm -hmm. when they go off track. And so a lot of times when I, uh, I've actually had clients who come in and say, my metabolism is completely trashed and damaged and it's, it's a mess and I don't understand what's happening. And those are real emotions that I'm, I'm always very sensitive to, but mm -hmm. start, I've even had some clients who come in in that state and they've had their metabolic rate measured right. and it's extremely, extremely, extremely normal. Yeah. Okay. And so when you pry deeper, what you find out is either they've had a huge reduction in their non-exercise activity mm -hmm. or um, there's either tracking inconsistencies or tracking uh, or adherence inconsistencies. Sure. Whether that be intentional or unintentional, as you've said. And uh, I, th I think, I think that was a great point. Like, you know, you're not making light of this idea of 80, 20 in terms of adherence. It's just that you get that same idea with people being really, really strict for like four to five days and then having just so they can enjoy the weekend more, but then not realizing that's probably having a knock on effect. So then that calorie deficit that they're trying to create, um, particularly if they're lean, because we're talking much smaller margins here of error. Um, yeah which is a really good point. But another great point that you actually mentioned there, which I want to elaborate on if we can, is that idea of how you took a break from the gym to drop the stress. And then that actually dropped the stress related water retention. Because as you said, a lot of people will just go hammer and nail, uh, train really hard. And as soon as they hit that plateau, think I need to work harder. And I bet many people listening, you know, won't, won't use deload weeks or breaks that regularly. So, you know, it, it, what's the science around that? Is there a science of having these kind of breaks as well, like diet breaks particularly that can help with this ongoing weight loss or it was just a case of dropping stress? So there's, there's two different ways to look at this. Um, you know, my particular training program at the time was remarkably uh, strenuous. Mm -hmm. uh, so in those situations where you're doing a lot of really high intensity training, you can, uh, because of, of the way that cortisol affects fluid retention, you can kind of induce a, a mild state of water retention, right? which is not necessarily problematic. Mm -hmm. um, the only reason it, it would be problematic is because your scale is not giving you the full story of your fat loss. Yeah. So, so my issue with that was not... Um, that the water or the fluid retention was actually hindering anything important. My concern was, am I actually losing this fat or not? It was really yeah, more yeah. of a fact checking mission to make yeah. sure things were on track. Mm -hmm. Once they were, I said, oh, cool. I'll go back to retaining fluid. <laughs> like, yeah, it's fine. yeah, 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 yeah. And as long as I drop it before I'm on stage, I'm good. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, the, the fluid retention, the only trouble with it is that it's masking potentially your ability to objectively, uh, observe your results yeah now the question of diet breaks is a different question and what we've seen is there are different strategies using either refeeds or diet breaks mm -hmm. that uh that do seem to be helpful as it pertains to metabolic adaptation and long-term weight loss uh programs so 
there was a study fairly recently. Uh, I don't know. I've lost track of time. I work from home, so I like yeah, I yeah, don't yeah. have a schedule. It could have been a week ago. It could have been a year ago, <laughs> but it was it was this decade for sure. Yeah. But they they did two weeks of weight loss and then two weeks of weight maintenance. Yes. Now, here's the thing: when when someone says diet break, they don't mean a break from the diet. Yeah. Yeah. They, they mean instead of being in an energy deficit, we're going to be at energy maintenance, which is still not a super fun, super laid back thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's a huge distinction. But what they did was one group just did like 16 weeks of regular dieting. The other group spent 16 weeks in the same deficit, but they broke it up. So mm -hmm. they did two weeks of dieting, two weeks of maintenance. So their intervention took twice as long. Yeah. But what they found was that taking those diet breaks uh, seemed to be helpful in terms of reducing this adaptive drop in energy expenditure, and it seemed to have more favorable effects on fat loss over time. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the big caveat there is the, the very obvious fact that there were some benefits, but the big drawback was instead of dieting for 16 weeks, you were dieting for 30 or 32, which is not awesome. You know, people generally would say, well, let's just get this thing done and let's move on. So mm -hmm. there's pros and cons to it, but there, there's the physiological benefits that, you know, having those intermittent periods of weight maintenance uh, or, or maintenance calories seems to be helpful. The question, how long do you have to be at maintenance to get a positive effect from that? I would speculate that probably the ideal ratio and this is heavy speculation but it's based sure. on seeing some interventions that work some interventions that don't work two weeks on and two weeks off is great but it's uh, it's hard to sell the idea of like hey let's be for on a diet for twice as long yeah so i think probably a good uh middle ground there is to do three weeks in a deficit and then one week at maintenance if mm -hmm. you want to implement this type of strategy um so, so that's kind of like a periodic diet break thing. I do know some people who have had a lot of success with really motivated, detailed oriented clients, mm -hmm. uh, detail oriented clients who they'll know they have a lot of weight loss. Like we're, we're going to be on this diet for minimum 30, 40 weeks. We already know that on the front end. And so what they'll do is they'll break the diet down in phases. They'll say like, you know what, let's do let's accomplish like 30% of our weight loss goal. And maybe it takes 12 weeks or 18 weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. We do that and then we just kind of chill for a while. And maybe, maybe we maintain weight for three or four weeks. Maybe we regain a tiny bit, but not a lot. And then we'll do the next phase of the diet. Mm -hmm. And so that's an even more relaxed approach where you can have a little more wiggle room with the calories. It doesn't have to be perfectly at maintenance. Maybe you can go even a little above maintenance or take like a week where you say like, hey, eat sensibly, but let's not worry about tracking for a week or two. Let's just kind of do our thing. Mm -hmm. So that is more of a, I, I would speculate more of a psychological benefit of breaking when you, when you have this huge weight loss goal, a lot of times one of the most challenging aspects is it's daunting mm. and you work really hard and you're really invested and you make a lot of progress, but all of a sudden you, you look at, at your scale and you look at the calendar and you say, I've been working really hard for a really long time. I already don't feel great. And I'm a, you know, a sixth of the way there. Mm -hmm. That could be a tough pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. So there is some inherent benefit for those types of weight loss uh, journeys, so to speak, where you'd say, you know what, let's divide this up into three goals. Let's, we'll, we'll be at this weight by this date, and then we'll chill. And then we'll do phase two, and then we'll do phase three. And before you know it, we're, we're there. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some really great stuff there. I like, like the idea, as you said, of you need to kind of, if you're affecting a stall, first of all, experiencing a stall, first of all, that idea of actually just having a, a week or so to, well, a week to chill out from the gym to see if it's water retention will allow that to drop off. And then you'll see that you've made progress. So do that before you make any silly dietary changes or, or throw the towel in. Um, and then this idea of phasic dieting so that you have periods of being in a deficit and periods of maintenance, you can make that fit your own schedule. You can make it fit events in a calendar of the year. And I think that works really well for a lot of people to think about is that idea of cr chronic dieting isn't, isn't life. Like you shouldn't just be in a deficit for the rest of your life. It's the idea of let's hammer it then for 
six to eight weeks and then have two to four weeks chill um, because at least then they're going to be more on it for that period because they know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel as opposed to just thinking crap this deficit is my life now yeah and if if i could add one little caveat mm. um the whole idea of you know absolutely you should kind of if you think water retention could be masking some fat loss that you're mm -hmm. not observing on the scale it does make sense to scale down the training intensity for a short period of time yeah um that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go as far as I did and just not go to the gym. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you could just drop your volume and intensity significantly and treat it like a deload where you're still in there. You're not totally detraining, mm -hmm. um, but, but you're significantly reducing the recovery burden. You're giving yourself a chance to catch your breath and chill and recover. Yeah. So it doesn't have, you don't, you don't have to go the nuclear option and say, okay, I'm never <laughs> going to do this for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but for me, I, I, that was just like, I, I think I had a bunch of stuff to work on. I was like, ah, screw it. I'm not going to go to the gym and do a bunch of really easy submaximal stuff. I'm just going to chill. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, I remember I was helping a friend with weight loss and she was looking, she, she tracked her weight every single day and she was like, well, I got to make a change now cause I'm stalled. And I was like, let, let me take a look at your, your weight journal. And I looked at it, I was like, this is not a stall, <laughs> you know? So another thing to keep in mind is that body weight's going to fluctuate. It is going to go up and down and it's going to be a little bit chaotic. Mm. And you should make all of your decisions based on, I would say at minimum, seven day averages. Yep. So, you know, I, I, my friend, you know, she didn't have a ton of experience doing weight loss in a really objective, like tracked way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at it, I was like, you just had, you know, out of four days, you had three slightly high weigh-ins. That's, that's not a plateau. You know, if you, if you look at your weekly seven-day averages, you're still going down. And every time she would come to me and say, like, it's time for a drop, and I'd say, it's definitely not. Then the next, like, three days, she would have low, 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 low yeah. uh, weigh-ins. So you, 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 you got to be... Uh, you got to find that perfect balance where you're patient enough not to make aggressive, overly aggressive decisions, but you are persistent enough to continue that with the consistency that's required. Mm -hmm. It's tough. It, it's hard to find that middle ground. A lot of people are, are, you know, they're either full blast into it. And then when they hit resistance, it's either I'm going to triple my effort or I'm going to walk away from it. What's really hard is when you have a few bad weigh-ins in a row, but you have the controlled, you know, consistent motivation to say, I'm not going to make any rash decisions here, uh, but I'm going to continue my consistency as I have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, perfect. I think a lot of people listening actually would have never considered a, a, a deload week in their life. And so it's, it's a cool concept to bring to the table to a lot of people, the idea of taking a break from training. Um, and then, yeah, that just idea of, make sure you're using averages when it comes to weight because we know of the the fluctuations that come to scale weight from a day-to-day -day basis and so i guess the one of the things that i would ask about you brought up the idea of the biggest loser study before and then this idea of of them um kind of slowly sort of gaining the weight back and so we talked just then about this idea of deficits not not being forever and you can take a, a break at maintenance or, or come back to maintenance after the diet break uh, sort of diet is over but if this idea of there being a small bit of metabolic adaptation is there where are people going to with their caloric intake to maintain weight because there's that idea of if my weight stalled surely if i eat more calories i'm just going to put more weight back on yeah so the question is i uh, basically we're on this diet and we get to where we want to be and then what do we do with calories is that, is yeah. that the question yeah because people worry that they're like oh my weight stalled at this calorie level so surely if i eat more i'll i'll actually gain weight and so people kind of get into that idea of maybe chronic under eating but they're having yeah. maybe those those you know those big weekends or big weeks off and actually they're not chronically under eating they just are for 75 percent of the time let's say yeah so so here's the thing to keep in mind when people say uh so this is kind of funny. Uh, a lot of physique athletes, like bodybuilders, figure, whatever, 
there, there became this trend where people wanted to brag about how much they were eating after competitions mm -hmm. while still staying lean. Yep. Okay. And so the thing you have to keep in mind with energy balance is that it's adaptable, but it's also cumulative. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people are incorrect when they say I am weight stable at this caloric intake. Because what's really happening is, you know, when people say like, oh my God, I'm like weight stable and this is a low caloric intake, what am I going to do? You're probably still in a deficit. It's probably just not large enough to make really rapid changes in, in body weight. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the inverse side, you would have these physique athletes who are like, well, I'm still as lean as I was on stage and now I'm eating, you know, 800 more calories or 1600 more calories. And it's like, yeah, but if you keep eating that, in eight weeks, you're not, you're not going to be that lean anymore. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. you think you're weight stable, but you're not. It just takes time to accumulate significant amounts of mass or yeah. conversely to lose significant amounts of mass. So mm. I think a lot of people fail to recognize when they're truly at a maintenance level. And a lot of people fail to account for the fact that ma the, the true maintenance level is adaptable in both directions. So mm -hmm let's say I'm dieting, I'm dieting, I'm dieting. I'm at a body composition that I feel pretty good about, but I'm in a, you know, I, I'm still probably in some degree of a slight energy deficit day to day. Mm -hmm. um, what can happen is there's some kind of buffer room where you can probably increase your calories a little bit and go from being in a slight deficit to being at maintenance. Mm -hmm. And some people are very resistant to weight gain. Um, and one of the reasons they are is because if we take someone at their normal body weight, we bring them into a lab and we intentionally overfeed them. Some people, when you overfeed them, they have uh, an adaptive increase in energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. And so their body actually resists that weight gain because we have the ability to downregulate and upregulate total energy expenditure based on being in a deficit or being in a surplus of calories. Mm -hmm. Some people can increase once they get to the body weight they want, they can increase their calories a little bit just to essentially remove a deficit, whether that's like a hundred, 200, 300 calorie a day deficit. All of a sudden you can add those calories back in and you're still weight stable. Mm -hmm. Some people, depending, especially depending on how lean they are and how much weight they've lost, can even get a little more of a bump because as they start creeping their calories upward, uh, they have kind of a slightly adaptive increase in energy expenditure, mostly due to non-exercise activity. They're basically reversing the down regulation that occurred. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not, that was another misconception in the physique world was people thought after their show that they were like supercharging their metabolism, do, doing some kind of uh, really experimental stuff. And, in reality, what was happening was they had a, they had a, a down regulation of their total energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. They got lean. They got rid of their deficit. That was step one. And then step two was as they built up their caloric intake, uh, they were having an adaptive increase in non-exercise activity that was reversing their, their metabolic down regulation and their metabolic adaptation. And in some cases, even going above their typical baseline level of non-exercise activity. Mm -hmm. The tricky part is following weight loss, um, a study my lab did a few years ago now, we looked at physique athletes and we, we intervened, I, I wouldn't say we intervened, but we observed immediately after their competition, what happens. Mm -hmm. And one of the really distressing things that's unfortunate, and these people got pretty lean, so that's something to keep in mind, but in the four to six weeks following the end of that diet, um, not a lot of lean mass is getting gained. There, there was pretty much all the mass that was getting regained was an initial increase in, in water weight and then a pretty steady increase in fat mass. And so one thing that's going to be tricky is, you know, after a diet, especially if you got pretty lean or you lost a pretty significant amount of, of fat, mm -hmm. the body is uh, fairly primed to prefer uh, restoring the fat that was lost. So you have to be careful about exactly how you transition out of that diet. Mm -hmm. You will, in most circumstances, be able to maintain that weight loss at a slightly higher caloric intake than where you decided to stop being in a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, 
but how high it's really going to depend on exactly how well you respond as, as the calories start to go up. Yeah. Cause that, that response to overfeeding is very much genetic and individual, isn't it? Some people will burn it all off with extra non-exercise activity and other people will just soak it all up like a sponge and stay stationary, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's, it's really funny because you'll run into those people who are really fit and have been lean their whole life. And they're like, they're very judgmental when it comes to people who struggle with their weight. And they're like, yeah. Oh my God, you know, they say all these really harsh things. And it's like, we have the research where we bring people into a lab, we intentionally overfeed them. And some people very readily, very easily gain all the weight we would expect them to gain. Mm -hmm. Other people adaptively, their energy expenditure goes through the roof. They resist that weight gain and they don't gain it. Yeah. They just don't. And so it it's really uh, comical when when people have been very fortunate with their genetic lottery and you know they are extremely resistant to fat gain and mm -hmm. then they they have all these judgmental opinions of people who didn't get that that uh, fortunate genetic draw and it's like dude you have, you have no bearing over this like you yeah. just you know and, and uh, that that's a double edged sword because I do like my my main message I always like to uh, reinforce for people is you do have the ability to control this. Mm. Um, some people view that as like, you know, some people view that as a negative thing of like, Oh, you're telling me it's my fault that I have the body composition I have. That's not what I'm telling you. But what I'm telling you is you have the autonomy uh, and the ability to take control of that and manage it. Mm. Not everyone starts at the same place and not everyone has the same. Uh, it's harder for some people than others without mm. question. It, or yeah. you could look at it the other way and say it's easier for some people than others. You know, people who are resistant to fat gain, this is not something they're going to struggle with is trying to stay lean. Um, they might have other struggles. You know, they might struggle to put on muscle, but everyone ha has different genetics that we start with mm -hmm. and it, it makes it easier or harder for some people, but everyone has the ability to fight past those, uh, those genetic limits uh, or, or genetic predispositions and really take control of this and start putting their mark on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. It's it, these are the people that we uh, anecdotally hate who can eat anything they want and seem to not gain weight. But as you said, there'll be, there'll be drawbacks to potentially their ability to gain this idea of hard gain as that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, that non-exercise activity, it's a, a huge play with both weight loss and then that weight gain again, which is why everyone seems so hot about, you know, get, you know, getting people's steps up and such, isn't it? So it's a great yeah. point to make. Um, brilliant. You know, I think, I think we've covered a, a lot of great detail there that the listeners can really action on. Um, Eric, if, is there a particular place you would love people to go to find out more about you and your work? Yeah, so the, the easiest place, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, my handle is at Trexler Fitness. Um, usually I keep people updated with what I'm doing there. Uh, our website is strongerbyscience.com and we have a podcast that goes up every Thursday. Um, and then uh, Mass, M-A-S-S, -S, that is our research review that goes out every month where we talk about about 10 of the most, uh, most interesting, most important studies that happened that previous month as it pertains to exercise and nutrition so if you want to stay up to date with me those are the places to do it great i'll, I'll link up to those in the show notes um eric thank you so much again for taking the time i really appreciate uh, this conversation yeah thank you for having me on